Cool. Yeah, no, I guess it undid it. So, <laughs> so. I know. Like. All right. Okay. Oh, gender. Yes, so that is your gender. Okay, good. Here. Oh, yeah, that's always it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, roll call. So, we are on the record at 502. Um, who's that? Is this everybody? There's six of us. There's six. There's six. Okay. Uh, all committee members are present. Um, everybody had a chance to review the agenda, even though it's really complicated. <laughs> oh, so that was my thing too. Move to approve. All right. Any opposition to the agenda or any changes? Second one's been twice. Twenty third. All right. So the agenda is as presented. Um, this was the minutes from last time. I did do some of it already. Um, And confirm the minutes are just the two page document. Correct. The, the minutes, which is the legal record, and the notes, yeah. which is just the reference. Um, move to approve the minutes as provided. Second. Any objections? All look great. Everybody else? Okay. Um, Passing by unanimous consent. All right. Um, at this point, we're just going to move the whole, unless there's anything else that took, took the agenda. Um, anybody opposed to entering the committee in the whole? Going once, going twice, sold. All right. Committee of the whole basically says, start hashing this out. Um, I guess just a thought. The mayor said, oh, find something I'm going to be happy with. Not possible. Bad, bad idea. Um, I guess the. And can we kind of put this in notes just a little bit? Or is this, this is recorded, so. It's recorded. <clears throat> That's kind of why I wasn't like, taking serious we're, notes. But. We're all here for different reasons. Everybody's got a different view, a different angle, different acts, or whatever. Um, what, what's your goals? I mean, you wrote basically sit down, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, what when we're done with this? How what would make you happy? I would like to quit losing projects because of the cost of landscaping in the city. Cool. Ditto. That's exactly that's why you're here too. Yeah, I'm tired of the grumbling. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in addition to that, it would be having a um, uh, a simpler, easier to apply code. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. which is yeah. more black and white. Oh, was that? Yes. Mm -hmm. also want to add on that? Mm -hmm. Definitely helps with that. Uh, now, also, but also on the same side, I try to find something that the city is happy with too. I mean, it's it's two way, two edged sword for sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of that often comes down to telling them they're happy with it. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I guess you know that's that's where why I'm we have a committee like right? Yes. yes. I want um, people to drive to our community and live in our community and visit our community and say, This is beautiful. Not drive by and say, Oh, that you know it's, worth getting through. it's just a stop for gas or it you know, it looks like crap with all your mini malls. So, okay. Um, well, those some great mini malls. I want to stay there. <laughs> um, personally, having or experiencing this, um, yeah, I can see why you lose projects. And you know, I thought about it case spectrum wise. If you went to the far end and just scrapped it entirely, what are you going to get? You're going to get some of the junk that we've got. <clears throat> if it's too restrictive, then you're going to get this. So finding something that's realistic. If you're rolling into town and you want to build a building and not want to do any landscaping and trying to pinch it to the last penny, well, maybe you should go a little further out the road. Um, but you know, I'm I'm in a spot where landscaping across the street and down some looks nice. The two next door to each other, not so much. 
you know, it's it's a broad spectrum. You know, when I look at it, I thought, man, this is complicated when I was going through it. And I'm still trying to get my head around it. Um, so, yeah, that, that happy medium, I think, is the best way. And my eyes are basically through the, the property owner and developer. And that's got to suck for you guys sometimes, I can just imagine. Um, so, good goal. You know, when, when I was sitting there reading code and trying to figure it out, I'm like, this should be something you can explain to some of high school education and have them understand. That doesn't mean they're going to pick it up and read it and interpret it all, but you should be able to simply communicate it to somebody who's reasonable intelligence. There's also, there's also the element of surprise, and I can tell you from experience, bonding issue is a huge element of surprise with everybody that's ever come in into contact with. Hate of the deer here. So, this is a good spot. No, here. Excuse me, the model because I'm. Can you explain to me what that would look like? Or what is the bonding? Um, well, you, you need to provide a, basically a performance bond that your landscape is going to stay alive for two years. And is it held until it's the two year until, mark? until that two year period. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Tina. No, I was going to say, I can. If you want to have a win already on the table when we amended in March, we just did off. Okay. It's back to you hold we have the bond so we can get out and inspect it or okay. until some kind of inspection approved that it's been installed and then the bond's released. Okay. So it's back the way this was right. before. Okay. So, so that went away. Have you ever pulled anybody's bond? No. Uh, not yet. So the bonding was removed? No, no. 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 The requirement to hold it for two years. So you still have to submit a bond for the cost of the landscaping, but once the landscaping's installed and it's been inspected and confirmed that it's in place consistent with the, the approved landscape plan, then the bond is released. Okay. So then so the theoretically year, you could get it back the same year, but if you're a rollover project. So that's changed the intent then from being trying to make sure it gets established to correct. making sure it gets installed. Correct. It gets done. Exactly. Okay. Which was the way it was before. There was some conversation by some other people who suggested doing the two year. Mm -hmm. So we dropped it in in 17, but it's, it was, I mean, to be honest, from staff, it was a headache holding them and trying to track them. And, you know, and then two years, some people managed to cancel them out, even though they weren't supposed to be canceled, uh, you know, and they were the ones we needed to draw. On. And then, so yeah, we just went back to the way it used to be. So. Um, so to, I like to try to cut to the chase with things. Within, other than the subsidiary parts of code, like the warranty and some other items within it, I think there are three things within it that would make any of our clients happy. One is to allow the use of rock mulch because of the uh, winds. Uh, the second would be to reduce plant sizes to match what's commonly used in the area with mm -hmm. uh, Anchorage code. One, two, and then the third would be to uh, significantly reduce or eliminate the requirement for perennials. Um, and uh, I think what I have in here, what I noted was that if uh, perennials were required at corners and lots and up to a maximum distance of 100 feet apart, I think that's still a reasonable basis for a good looking community. Mm -hmm. a, a, a challenge with code is the code sometimes tries to protect you from the worst case scenario. So your entire code is built around the 5% of people that abuse things mm -hmm. versus as focusing. In my, uh, exactly. Right. <laughs> and it's a 5% rule as opposed to also the 5% of people you look for that do the best stuff. The perennials, I, I think, are a great intent to them. Anchorage has a little bit of a perennial built in. You can trade it off for other things, but they don't necessarily think it would be as effective. But I think the, the big item is perennials because they're typically, they typically double the project cost. They're the toughest to keep alive, too. Yeah, I was going to say, that was one thing that I was looking around at landscaping. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and, yeah. and discussion with things like perennials is that I think Can I ask a good question? Oh, sure. Perennials, we're talking perennials versus, you know, like, okay. Versus, I don't know, when you're talking perennials, you're talking like, Flowers. flowers. Flowers and grasses? Or uh, shrubbery? Well, the, the, what category is you talking Flowers and grasses. <coughs> okay. Yeah, ornament, not, ornamental grasses. Not, so not, not shrubberies. No. Not shrubberies. Okay, uh, those from trees. a botanical definition, and within the current code, it says flowering uh, perennials, which would be the irises, the daylilies, the ones that have a little bit more digital so impact. Toughest to keep on. Yeah. 
And and what I'm interested in with this is that I think that there's a chance to make the code uh, better than codes in other places, especially when it comes to things like soil. Yeah. Um, because if you provide good soil, you increase moisture retention, and you like the weather we have right now. I'm going to be surprised if some of the projects that have been installed in the past couple of years are getting the maintenance they need. Uh, uh, I can't get water to it right now, and it's suffering. And they're in mm -hmm. bad soils, typically. Yeah. Well, of course, we get good soils, but and not speaking years. Yeah. Well, I'm just speaking personal experience, which is what I got. But uh, we, we still don't have plumbing because we're putting an irrigation system, and the hose can't reach. Can't get any hose in the front, so it's either hire a water truck or keep praying. Right now, we're praying. Mm -hmm. and, and that relates to the possibility within the code of uh, still having a little bit of a, a stick, but then having the incentives, it'll get rid of it. So if someone puts in better soil, it softens other parts of it. Or someone puts in an irrigation system, it softens it's something just, else. Yeah, just, so. and, and that's the complexity. Is there three things we can do to make it, make it uh, better mm -hmm. for feasibility? And then beyond that, there are ways to achieve beautification. Um, and to uh, have the community good to it. And my question, I think, is for the purposes of the committee, um, the code as it is can be modified to be functional. We could choose to throw the code out the window and to get something that's completely new and as tight as it can be and it's, it's you know, perfect or somewhere in between. Then maybe we decide after some things have been discussed or decided. Um, I really liked that you provided uh, the Anchorage Code, uh, Fairbanks, um, Soldata, oh. and other areas. Mm -hmm. My type A, from a consultant point of view, I like consistency. So I would love it if our landscape codes look more like, like each other. And Anchorage is actually a pretty concise, effective code. Um, it, but it's not like people would say, oh, yeah, well, let's photocopy Anchorage's code or things oh. like that. Or it, it was funny as I looked at some of the codes that came from Florida and you know, the Northwest. And I, I spent the fourth down in uh, I was around Seattle, various places. And one thing I noticed there was just what is it is there? You can't, I don't think you can kill anything down there. I mean, you plant something, it just, I mean, and it's amazing to me how many homes they can stuff into an area. You look around every corner, and there's just people. And but they they get their vegetation to just it's like a green mat and it just grows vertically, just nuts. They don't really do that here. Um, it's not as arid as city Arizona, but if if we're thinking we can say, oh, it needs to look like that. It's like, well, and for comparison, the Wasilla code and the Anchorage code are very similar, except that the Wasilla code is more strange. Oh. Uh, what does Anchorage code say about rock mulch? I'm curious. Um, any mulch type is allowed. Okay. Because technically, I have rock mulch in front of my place. That's great. It never blows away. Yeah, that, that was okay. Got to rake it back up. Popped out, looking around. You know, if you do have bark mulch, it looks great when it's first installed. And then a lot of it starts getting uh, sun bleached and it gets sand and oh, all that stuff and blown away. And it just starts to look like crap. I mean, it just starts to look almost the same as rock mulch. Almost the same tool. And then if it's not blown away, typically with bark mulch, you're committing yourself to a three to five year replacement schedule yeah. because it does it, it does what it's supposed to do. It keeps moisture and it decomposes, it degrades. Um, so for best plant health and aesthetics, you do want to replace it. Yeah, commitment. Um, the problem is, is they don't think the maintenance is getting done. No, so if no. it's installed once, people get no, there, was... they get it done, and then it turns into a dirt pile. And Die, and all of a sudden you've got this bed that's got nothing in it. The rock ones do the same though. They do. For whatever reason, they, they, they get covered in weeds. Well, or it's or called, it's yeah. called uh, the plow, uh, the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> the parking lot sanding and the plowing fills them right up. Uh, pretty much every year we have the basketball team or whichever. Sports team that wants to make a couple bucks come in and sweep our lot, even though the plow guys will sweep it for cheaper. You know, have them come in and do some stuff. And sometimes the plow guys get there first, and so we'll have 
two or three wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow set up, and they shovel out the rock mulch and sift it put it back. So they, just because it's rock doesn't mean it. Right. It means it's free. Right. It just means it doesn't blow away. Right. And that brings up another maintenance issue with things like that is those areas that have rock mulch for planting purposes aren't supposed to be used for snow storage. Right. Any anywhere that's not planting purposes can be rock mulch. Right. So the snow storage areas can be rock mulch. Right. And and my my message is uh, you think it's not snow storage until the plug guys show up and then they find ways to make the snow storage. <laughs> yeah. And you know it's a we have ours out on the point of where you leave the parking lot and go out on the road and that uh, gets maybe clouded and put stuff's gonna blow and it just happens. Mm -hmm. Now the bulk of it doesn't get stored there because it would be really deep. Like classic snow storage, but plow guys are pretty creative sometimes. I'm like, oh, how'd you get that there? Well, it looked good. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw this one out there, not because I'm defensive about it necessarily, but I know the mulch has been the contention since day one. Interestingly enough, it's been in the code since 96, so I don't know why it's such a hot topic today and it's never been talked about in the past, but that's neither here nor there. What I'm curious to see, and I haven't seen it, so I'm hoping you guys can help, is the Anchorage code. What we see in the valley before we had landscape architects and sometimes after we see landscape architects is a few plantings and a 10 foot wide strip of rocks. Okay, so the rocks aren't using rock as mulch is not the problem. It's how do you write the code so that someone does a creative use of rock? Because Dr. Larson, you use rock and grass, they and rocks, rocks. you know they're curved. It's not a straight bed. It's so I think there's a use for rock mulch, and there's a way you can use it that would be attractive. And then you see, I'm just gonna throw them out there, Panda Express, and it's just a sea of rocks yeah. with weeds growing through it and a couple dying plants coming up through it. So how do you, you know, how do you Something. require that creativity and that multi-use of elements mm -hmm. instead of it's, just a bed of rocks? It's kind of the, the, the code a cascade. One of the things we often do is, uh, so currently the code doesn't allow mown grass to be within the planting bed. So what we'll do is, uh, in Anchorage, is that you wind up creating planting pockets with mown grass mm -hmm. between them. So you wind up getting these curved lines where, um, they're defined by the other landscape elements. Actually, it is allowed now. Uh, if you use the definition, but it needs to be cleared it, it up. It depends on whether it's mown lawn or not. Is it, the way it reads right now is more so that it's a. Yeah, I understand. No, the definition says mown lawn. The, the, mode mode lawn. Okay. the other one mode. needs to be cleaned up okay. to match it, is what didn't happen. Okay. So you're right about the. The clarity and making it clear that that's an option under the ground cover. Yeah. And it all depends on clients because there's some clients that would prefer to avoid uh, the maintenance of mown lawns. Um, <laughs> and then your only other options really are asphalt or rock mulch or. <laughs> well, and the, a planting bed is not just the mulch, it's the plant material. So if you can get a nice variety of plant material and sizes and yeah. shapes and things like that, that provides a lot of interest. And your rock mulch doesn't stand out so much. And uh, Anchorage uh, bed widths are uh, an eight foot minimum average with a minimum of five and a maximum of 12 to achieve the width. So you can actually vary uh, the width of your planting beds use, but that has to be a planting bed. And the one way I think that the silicone could be better would be to say that uh, all of the area within the planting bed has to be 12 inch planting soil. 12 inch deep. 12 inch. At 12 inch for everything, but then where trees go and it gets deeper. Yeah, I don't see that happening either. <laughs> well, and then at least on, at least on no, any of our projects. What I mean, I mean, actually, so I sat in McDonald's drive through and they literally planted the grass in that rocky hard pan yeah. stuff. And then they came and spread topsoil on top of it after the plants were in the ground. And I'm sitting there going, I'm no landscape architect, but I don't think that's what the plan's <laughs> called for. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be a great spring prayer right there. It's a great next step to this conversation for making good code is how to what steps to have in place for a uh, follow through. Enforcement, just saying. Same Enforcement, thing. yeah. And the, the challenge for us is that we're often working, especially out here, the clients will only ever develop one site. So they're not familiar with any of the process. Right. Mm -hmm. So for them, they'll hire a contractor based on low bid. And the contractors do, do what they normally do um, because they don't know better. They don't read the drawings versus somehow having um, some skin in the game. And that's why uh, 
from a bond perspective, if there was a reduced bond um, that was for the two-year maintenance time, I think that's actually an effective way to do it. Anchor does do that. It's just not the full replacement bond because that's a really big amount of money. That's a big amount. Anchorage is tied to the square footage of the lot. So that planning bid you were talking about in Anchorage, you said it had it had to be an average of eight. Minimum, with a minimum uh, an average, a minimum average of eight feet, but you can skinny it to five. But then you have to make it wider up to twelve somewhere else in order to get the average. Oh right, right, yeah. So ours says right now, average of ten with a minimum of six. Yeah. So okay. So yeah, that was a nice, and... a nice addition to the code. We're allowed it to go down, but what I like is the specificity for Anchorage is that it gives a limit to how wide you make it, so that you don't just have this thin strip with a big wide area, because that's the way to abuse it. Okay, thanks. And there are aspects like that with kind of the three points, uh, you know, the, the, the planting where the beds adds to it related to the mulch, where there's pretty easy changes to make to the existing code. So, I heard way back, it was, I don't remember where it's from now, it was a speeding ticket class, and the guy was talking about three things to get people to behave. It's engineering, education, and enforcement. Design it, explain it, keep track of it. So, if you have these contractors that know what the code is, and I think, well, to get a permit, anybody in the city come through. And if they're the low bed and they don't have the driver's top or something like that, and you go out there and stuff a ruler and it can go to nest, that would solve a lot of things. Well, one thing I've noticed about some of our projects is a lot of people come in and they are not commercial developers. They are residential developers and they think, oh, I'm going to come to West Dillon and it's going to be easy. Yep. And so it's a, it's a totally different mindset for commercial development. And those contractors tend to have very rude week. And we, on some of our drawings, we started putting up very big notes that said the contractor is responsible to. Uh, install this new permit requirements, or there may be literally there may be ramifications um, oh, yeah. because it's, they'll just go nuts and not even follow the plans. Like the planting material, and then it's just shredded around. Um, so that that accountability, the 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 accountability process fails developers. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you want to be a commercial developer, just you know, watch and buy. It's fun. What contract version is it? I think simplifying the code would make it a lot easier for the new contractors that come in. And I think it would make it easier for the developers who are usually, like Peter said, some individual person, a small business owner who just wants to do one lot. Mm -hmm. they, we can point to the code and say, okay, this is what we need to do. And it's very plain it, and it's something that they can kind of comprehend. You know, we, as professionals can handle the, the details because that's what we're supposed to do. But we need to be able to explain this to our client and have them understand this is what your responsibility is. This is what you need to do to get a permit in the city. And that there's been a lot of confusion with clients about them not completely understanding how the code reads. And there's, it's just, it's very difficult sometimes to explain. So having something very simple that we can point to and say, this is what you need, this is what's required, then they can understand it. And I think it, it makes them less frustrated because there are less surprises for them. So I'm going to plead a little bit of maybe on a little bit behind the times. It seems like in the code, there's landscaping and then there's parking lot landscaping, two separate areas of the code. That I think that's one area that has always thrown me off when I've gone through the code and, and read through it and stuff. It's, why is it all this stuff in just one area instead of instead of? Well, I think it's been refined basically to be in the. It is, it's in the one section now, and uh, it's the site perimeter, mm -hmm. parking lot landscaping, a modifier related to street trees if you're on uh, streets, mm -hmm. um, and then parking interior. And the one that's a little bit amorphous is the 15% uh, of the site yeah. um, allocated to landscaping because that um, 
anchor tag is a similar thing. Your, the rest of your site is supposed to be visual enhancement landscaping, but there's no quantification to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on how permitting would use it as to how you like, uh, you know, how many trees change it from being just lawn right. into being uh, uh, landscape. And one thing that a lot of people have mentioned to me that I thought was kind of funny is they drive down the road and they see these pieces of fencing. Why why did they do that? Well, that's a good requirement. So maybe something kind of a small detail, but something to kind of think about is instead of having, okay, you have a fence, you have a rock smack to this, say you need to have a combination of some sort of non-vegetated interest or something so people can pick the Pick a bench or something or next to a sidewalk instead of putting a fence out there. But it, it allows people to kind of play with some of their site, and then that leads to a little bit of personal pride in their property. And that may potentially. How about the growth? Right. If, if they can Same have kind of a, a say in some of their, their landscaping, <coughs> I think that may kind of encourage them to help with the maintenance. I am not a fence for all those things just get knocked over by clouds or then they get neglected and then all the crap. Right, right. And what's really com what becomes complex with these from a code perspective is that if there are some codes that work with the unit um, uh, credits that you have to spend five points for every hundred feet and you can spend your points with this is a, a point for a boulder, those start to get be very complex and they're not permit department friendly because it just starts to be a mathematical thing of counting points as you go through. So one of the benefits of the amorphous part of it right now is that yes, you're required those items and they're all present and they're all split rail because of cost. I think the only one that I'm aware of that might not have done split rail was maybe Goodwill because they wanted to do something a bit more architectural. Did they wind up doing that or did they put in split rail? No, I think that, I don't know. Okay. And, and, that, that, split rail, and, and that, really, that really goes back to the path of least resistance for, mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. That happens is eventually they fall down. Right. And it, it doesn't really. Where did that come from? Why 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 is that there? Wait, no. so oh, it's been been there. there. It's one of those it left just said, it just said you will put a fence in. Period. Well, and that's the interesting thing with the code as well is that it said uh, it said uh, boulders, fencing, and perennials, um, uh, and that because it said and they were all required. Yeah, Lord help yeah. me, love to see that go away. I do not understand it. I think it's silly. And it, it, it goes back to that incentive aspect to this because there is a benefit for particular sites uh, with the boulders or elements. So how do you? I'm a fan of the gigantic rocks and stuff, so I should stand the track. Cool. It's a great way to protect your trees. They won't work about this big. We have literally a snow machine halfway up a tree. One year. Fortunately, that tree survived until I began to it, but uh, it, it escaped a gigantic rock. And, uh, problem solved. Well, in the first part of the code, they, the goal is to have a beautiful landscape. So to allow composition to occur rather than you have to have a piece of fence, so we have just smash it in somewhere. So giving us the flexibility, the designer the flexibility and the owner the flexibility to come up with something creative will create a more attractive landscape than just you have to have a fence. So they plop a piece of fence there and there's no composition, there's no thought behind it, it's just meeting the code requirement. So, I mean, like a fence section could potentially be part of the composition, but there needs to be some way for flexibility and creativity to create that beauty. And and beauty is hard because beauty is an eye of the holder. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I say beauty and somebody... I'd rather a bench than a fence. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to the incentive part of it for the betterment of the community, especially if you're located on a road and you provide a little sitting area, that there should be some way to uh, value that, that uh, when I'm someone puts that. in their, when someone puts in their code landscape, they might be so unhappy with it, they don't want to do anything else versus, you know, how can they make things better? Yeah. Oh, I did put it in your packet, but it was in my, you know, reminder type of thing with a bunch of other information but, you're, but downtown isn't part of the review and I, I agree with you on the benches 
but then you have to think we're you're doing the landscaping for the basically the suburban part of the city. So well, that's and then you've got the multi-purpose paths and right having so, some flexibility there. Right, but I'm just saying, keep in mind that you're designing for the suburban, not the urban part. So and, it's kind of a different character. And to speak to that, depending on the facility in Anchorage, we have a, a community open space requirement. Um, so if you are developing a store, you actually, and I, I can't remember the square footage cutoffs, but you're supposed to have like an outside city area, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it might not be appropriate for certain types, but that incentive or the idea that, okay, we're on a busy highway, we don't want to venture out by the road. But if we have a little spot that are closer to the building, that adds community value. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing, so what, can you give us a look at what's the boundaries of the urban area that we're not involved in? Yeah, this one's pretty tiny. I could probably pull it up faster. All right. Up here. Great. Be, uh, hopefully I can uh, make a promise and I can't do it. But. Because Russell's well, so not that big. No, it's not. No, it has. But the downtown is even smaller. Right. And we're also not talking about industrial, are we? No, we have industrial. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, so the gray up here, yeah. the there's not much, but there is some in the airport. And the airport doesn't have landscaping requirements anyway, so. No, mostly. So. And, and for that, uh, I'm not originally from Anchorage. I'm from a small town, so I'm not a big fan of Anchorage. But I hate bringing it up, but there's some things that do work. Within industrial, commercial, or otherwise any zoning, the landscape code doesn't really change because the landscape code is that if you have industrial next to industrial, you don't have to put landscaping between them, except if you have a parking lot. So that's the same as code here. Um, and there really doesn't draw any differentiation between industrial and other uses. Oh, yeah, that's small. Yeah, it's really small. So that's why that's I said- storage so, units anyway. So see, downtown has a lot of the components that you guys are talking about. That open space, that seating area, hardscape counts towards your landscape on your site. If it's a public space versus a private restricted, you know, area. So when you're developing in downtown, you have that. They have the requirement for fencing between the parking and the street instead of the 10 foot perimeter bed. And it can be a wall with shrubs or a fence with shrubs. And depending on the width of it, depends on whether you have to have the shrubs or not. So the downtown has some of that flexibility that you may be looking at. So I'm not saying don't look at it, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying. That's not what you're focusing on. You're really dealing with all of this along the Parks Highway, the PW, Lucille, Lucas, because everything in this pinkish color, it's all down the highway, mm -hmm. comes down, KGB, goes up to Silverfish, that's commercial. So that's, and then in addition to that, anything on a major roadway that's this tan, this RR, is also tagged because it allows commercial up to 10,000 square feet. So our city, Really, you know, it's a, it's got a lot of commercial. I mean, and that's on purpose because we operate on sales tax. Yep. Even if, uh, in Anchorage, even for the lot, large lot commercial or large retail establishment, all sites are required to provide a pedestrian connection to the right of way. Um, so, and that's not in your current code, but that idea that communities do change and evolve over time. So making sure that things happen now and anticipate where you want to be. And not necessarily for that, but. Well, our code has a soft requirement about the sidewalks. It says, under the general approval criteria, Tim can probably point out faster than I can because <laughs> of your last two projects. But um, there's a requirement that if it's in an area that has services, you do have to put those sidewalks in. But it leaves, there's a lot of areas that don't have that, so therefore they're not required to do it. And this, you know, a good example at Anchorage is uh, whether it's a Walmart or something, um, like the center parking aisle will have the six foot sidewalk right. in it that connects yep. the building out to the bus yep. stop or the right of way. So going back to your first question, Chris, at the beginning of this was, you know, what, what is the, uh, what's, what are the success criteria at the end of this where we say that we did a good job? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's probably, the first level would be how do we simplify uh, development um, and whether that's judged by cost or otherwise. Then the second would be, um, I think, is how we make the code better when it comes to meeting the initial intent or community goals for Wasilla. So there might be some other things we choose to look at 
incentives or um, trying to appeal to the 25% of people that are good people that will do things. Right. Like to make it a bell curve issue and make it easy. I think it'd be a really good idea to add a sense of incentives that will help maintenance in particular. That's, right. Because that's what's critical in this. Yeah. When you look around, I mean, you could have, like Target, it's pretty simple landscaping, trees and shrubs. But there, Target is landscaping. <laughs> but yeah, there's some that are dying. There, there's okay, okay, you know, a bit that are dying here and there, but the shrubs that they do have are all being pruned. They're all in this you know, round, nice shape, look well and good. You know, they look great. And of course, they're all pretty mature. Can you do for that? Can you over the top of Target? Yeah. I, then, want, I want to see what he's. You, you go to, unfortunately, I'm going to bring up my own project, but you go to fine. Sun Mountain and they have a ton of plantings in there, but they're not maintaining it very well and a lot of them are dying off, unfortunately. And um, at least it looks like it. Um, and, and that's something I can't remember whether I put it in or not, but a key thing in any community I've the, been in is to. I encourage staffing or otherwise it's because unfortunately enforcement is yep. reality yeah, you know that, that the three-legged stool yeah. you're talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. enforcement is the last one yeah and i design it teach it and follow up yeah. okay so so i can't get that toolbar to go away for some reason that's right but, so anyway this is target this is the pw right here yeah. okay. So I don't know if you want to look at the whole thing. It's kind of hard even oh, still. It's not too bad. But they have trees and shrubs along here. They have those pockets like Peter was talking about with some gravel around the, you know, the beds and then the grass in between. So all this is grass in here, although this was taken in the spring, so you can't really sure. see it. Then they do have rocks in their landscape beds, but they have bigger shrubs. Now, I know when they were put in the ground, they weren't bigger and they have bigger trees now, yeah, so it gives yeah. a different so that's appearance. Where, yeah, it, it's all right. right. So, when them in the ground, right, to get bigger yeah. fast. When was this installed? I'm trying to think. It seems like it was in eight or nine, ten. Just like a year I'm or two. Right. It must have been around eight, Ish. nine. Misty? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I know it was before I came up here, and I came up here at 10, and I remember saying, Looking when the job came open, I said, if they don't have a target, I'm not even applying. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll have to apply to Anchorage because I can't do it. And I'm oh. like, well, there's a target check. We're good. Oh, that's funny. So uh, I, I'd already been through the area, but I hadn't checked for a char target. So a church and target, and, that was, and then the Home Depot and Lowe's. So. The target in Anchorage was going to a site that had highway screening landscaping of 30 feet wide. You can't disturb. And I was at a, uh, a commission meeting where they were there, and one of the commissioners said, don't worry about the trees. You can put Target underground, and you'll still be the busiest store in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, yeah too, not so. wrong. So they have, they do have some landscape islands. They do have that sidewalk, like Peter mentioned, mm -hmm. in a, at least one foot, no, two places. Looks like there's another one here for that building. And then they have the end caps. So they're kind of, they don't match our code today or at the time they went in. They Just did their own thing. They did a, what is that called? Well, most corporations have their own design. Right, right, right. right but there was a. But yeah, I'm trying to remember what it was called when you, you had the whole thing approved. Oh, master plan or something? Yeah, it was conditional use. Yes. Yeah, this one had a conditional use. So they came in with their plans. And so. Because that very much easy to talk. Yeah. yeah, except for this thing gets in the way. Wow. Well, go over to. Uh, uh, now Walgreens is easy. See, this is I just saw this today. I'm like, yeah, why don't people design it's like Walgreens? Smashburger, that oh, that's terrible. Is an ever loving mess. That should have never been built the way it was. But that's another issue for the code to solve. Right. It's it's one of those one you of put a high favorite. use in a little tiny spot, and it's yeah. it's a mess. It complies with the code, but it's just, it doesn't work well. No, I don't like it at all. No, and the landscaping is probably still not even meeting the code. I'm not sure. We have so many that are still. And I want you guys, when you're thinking simplicity too, don't just think simplicity for ease of use for a developer. Think of simplicity for maintenance and for enforcement. Because again, you have one planner and you have one code compliance officer that does animal control 60 yeah. to 80% of the time. Yep. So there's not a lot of time to go out and do this enforcement. So this um, is a good, so, good conversation because this is just, I mean, even if you just call this 
on called enforcement. So you have all these funky little planter beds and you get a little strip of grass. How much of this, is this the bare minimum? Is this required? Is there a way? That's the bare minimum. So cane, raising canes was over. That was part. So where's the cutoff? So they actually retrofitted some of these. Yeah. Right. So these may have a few more plantings. Because when I look at this, there is more landscaping per square foot here than there's a target by a mile. And uh, we, did, we did the renovations here. So for raising cane, they have higher brand standards. So that's right. why they put in a bunch more. And okay. then because the owners weren't happy with the site, they had us uh, go back to renovate uh, the other beds. So hopefully they're looking my, better than they were. My point of bringing up Target was that you have this sub, for the current code, substandard you know, landscaping was being maintained and it looks yeah. pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah what they have what, looks yeah, good. Yeah, whereas you go somewhere that's not being maintained, but it's installed the current code. And it looks like caca. Like that one. Yeah. It's like garbage, yeah, exactly. Just like that. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and that's the, it's the it's process. And now it looks good because right. all the right. vegetation's right. dying down. In the so I had to get, you know, yeah, right. And, and, it, and it comes back to people aren't afraid, or people, I, there's knowledge because people don't recognize, oh, it's I need water. water. Right. Um, so there's yet to, well, you're three things to look at. But I, and I think a critical part of it is enforcement or, or another two, which is, um, depending on the permit type and anchorage they used to have, you would have to submit a maintenance plan. So even you might consider that is in maintenance plans are super simple, a couple pages. But if you have a client go to the effort of submitting a maintenance plan, there at least then they can see what they might need to do. That's that or hand holding. Maybe make rather than having a maintenance bond, you show you have them, hey, I got I've come up with a two year, five year, whatever maintenance contract that's gonna meet this maintenance agreement or maintenance well, plan. Excuse me. You know, put in, or permit, yeah, put in an irrigation but, system and actually use it. Yeah, yeah. And then you put an incentive. But I do have a, a little bit, and Public Works probably has to get involved with this, but you start to incentivize people to put an irrigation system, or even just the water of the plants that they have, whether it's with the irrigation or not. Does the city have the amount, you know, how, with, how much more water is the city going to be then have to produce? Um, Landscape is very high and that, water requirement. I know it's well, on the back. It depends. Yeah. What about those that are watering at all? Well, it depends. What about those that are not watering at all? Yeah. What I like about what you say is that substituting the maintenance bond, which has a cost to carry it for two years, is having requiring people to have a maintenance contract in place for two years. Yeah. The establishment period is critical. Yeah. But yeah. well, they could cancel it the next day. Well, I'm just saying, but no, the contract, the I mean, contract. because the contract yeah. isn't anything. And again, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great idea. And I'm not trying to be get involved it? too much in the conversation. I'm just saying, again, I can tell you that we can't even physically get to every site, yeah. even the new ones, to go check them. And maybe that comes back and to And so that. then that's why we leaned toward last time toward an as-built landscape plan being submitted to the city that's signed off that's inspected by the landscape architect and it puts the cost back on the developer to make sure the soil is the right depth because otherwise we're going to have to contract with a landscape uh, contractor someone that knows this stuff to go out and do these inspections um, and then pass those fees back on anyway i mean there's no way the city can really absorb those costs i don't think i think part of the problem is if you put that requirement on the landscape architects they sometimes don't have any way to enforce that either, just because of where they're it's, it's the stick, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. and that's the the I mean, finding people to work is hard. <laughs> I, I think no, also to tight. come back to making the standards clear and simple, then then it's not such a big puzzle about if we just put some fair and clear guidelines from the beginning and it's easier to keep up. I mean, um, you'd think that you have an investment of $20,000 or something you would want to, right, <laughs> or whatever it is, you would want to follow through on that. I mean, yeah. you would want to follow through on that. And I think a, a good ballpark for cost is uh, it's approximately, I'm not counting the perennials in it, but so if it just did go down to trees, it's $1,200 for 30 feet. 
So any site has this investment that they're making, and I really like the idea of the contract for a landscape, having a landscape maintenance contract because 5, 10, 15 percent of people will cancel it. Other people will benefit from it because they're happy with, they're not, you don't realize they made a bad mistake. I forget. Were, right. were you saying they write up a contract with the city or are you saying no, they contract employ with a, a contract? With a, with a land, yeah, with a maintenance, gotcha. landscaping contractor. Mm -hmm. I, I like that because it's, it's kind of a positive. Right. Mm -hmm. you, and it could be either, either you get a bond or you get a contract. I mean, we can make a deal or, um, I, I, I hesitate to bring this up, but you could do something to tie it to, I guess, a business license or something like that where, you know, you're not going to get your renewal if you if you cancel this contract or you, you don't have bond reports or something like that. I mean, I hate to back up the back of that, of course. But yeah, it makes it a little bit easier to enforce, I suppose. But it's kind of a, like really it's convoluted though. If you have a developer who owns development, but the businesses inside of it are well, uh, that's commercial leasing. And I haven't checked in with staff at Anchorage yet because our code revision is five or six years old now. And in theory, there's a warranty that's uh, set by the size of your property um, that is bonded. And uh, but I don't necessarily know if they've been closing those out yeah. because they might be low enough that you know, people don't care about them or something. So I, I'll check in with the city to see how they do that. Because if we're closing that out, um, they're supposed to have an arborist or landscape architect or someone say, uh, the stuff is on the site. My stuff is good. So I look at question for you. So this is this is a spectrum. So you've got chewed up that whole block of canes and everything else. Canes are that bad. That little triangle cluster there, I don't understand. And then you have Petco, which basically has nothing. Up against Fred Myers. Fred Myers. Well, I was talking about Petco and that south there on his. Uh, Kudoka. No, uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. Head Express. Head, Head, Head Express. Express. Head well, Panthers. they have the required planting, sir. They did. Right, but theirs, theirs went to crap. They didn't have anything. Theirs is weird. Keynes is good, but tight. And then you got Fred's. No. Which isn't only that. They just plow. That's what they do. And, and Panda was also brand standard as well. Well, yeah, a, a mild version of the brand standard. Right. But it's just not maintained. But it's poor installed, if I guess. I think the biggest issue is the lack of maintenance. So I've seen mature trees die because hmm. the person who was maintaining didn't know really put water on them when they were having dry periods. Well, it was for the North Rim, I think it was the North Rim site where they had established trees like three or four years ago, established trees that were 20, 25 years old and they died because of the dry weather we had. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, wow. between the and it's one of those things when you talk to the, the manager or the banker otherwise, right. they're kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess we need someone to maintain our landscape. Just no, they they, ignorance in the real way. They just, mm -hmm. yeah, so there's a loss of institutional knowledge or something. Well, I noticed they planted some plants there and they're dying because they're still not firing. Because they don't have <laughs> Well, that was at the time when um, the, they got their hands slapped for the mortality there. And, you know, we went back and the owner was, it, it was literally like, oh, yeah, we have the water. Yeah, no idea. Best of intentions. But that so, goes back to the education part. Right. So, uh, and just for reference points for Anchorage for an acre site, the two year landscape warranty is about $7,500. So it's actually it's pretty small and it's meant to take care of, you know, three or four or five trees or something that they expect that people are maintaining. So it's not fully punitive. I still have a question about that. So I get pushed back all the time saying it's impossible to find a landscape bond. Can't get a bond. Don't know how to get a bond. Bonds are impossible to get. We can't get a bond. What are you talking about? A bond? I don't know what a bond is. And I look at them and go, you're really pulling my leg, aren't you? You, you don't it's, mean what you're saying. I mean, is it really that hard? Well, it's the same thing in Anchorage as well, because <laughs> owners don't bond. So I contract. So owners are in this new world of like, what do I do in a bond? Yeah, contractors are used to it. They're in the process mm -hmm. they've done all the paperwork. So that's a strange thing with owners. It was an education for me. But why wouldn't you have the landscape installer it's do the bond? Because you require the owner to do it. Yeah, you do. Well, I mean, it could be changed. I mean, what makes sense? Uh, <laughs> the owner? 
Twice well, and what, what's critical in there's kind of double dipping because when an owner hires a contractor, they're supposed to have a bonded contractor. So mm -hmm. the owner just needs to enforce it, pass it through to them to say, okay, you need to get bonding for two years, but then that cost goes back to the client. So it's a juggling. Yeah, it does make sense more to put it on the contractor for instances like you're talking about where they're low bid and they're doing stuff for as cheap as possible. It makes the contractor think about what they're doing yeah. a little bit better. That's the thing. Ideally. And but then they have to say, hey, I planted it. It was gorgeous and we never watered. Well, but you could also <laughs> so, bond. So a lot of codes, we, yeah, a lot of codes require that you maintain that your contractor maintains it for a year. That's written in some codes. Well, and that's the uh, that's about the ignorance of the one-time developer. And I'd say there's a good way of not knowing mm -hmm. is that if you hire a contractor, if you work on a building, you have a one-year warranty. You need a one-year warranty on your landscape as well, mm -hmm. and the contractor possible to maintain it because that's the only way that they know their plants have been taken care of. And yeah. the contractors. Right. So anybody that just pops their plants in and walks away, that material could be horrible because they don't know they have to warrant they don't have to warrant it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well then they might not know what they're doing. And then that uh, bonds always go back to the owner for the value of them. Contractors pass it on. Um, so yeah, for something right. for something yeah. like this, rather than the uh, changing it from a bond to require the landscape being installed versus the uh, enforcing a warranty, that's the intent of Anchorage is enforcing the warranty period. Um, here, a certificate of occupancy. We don't do the COs. So there's no there's no uh, stick. <laughs> no, yeah. that's the problem because we don't. We don't have the borough does our plans review yep. and acts as a building official. Now they issue a seal, but we don't. We issue a land use permit that includes your landscape plan, but the structural and the CO is owned by the borough. Is there any way to tie to the borough for the CO? Be hard. Is the, the problem? The thing is, the, the borough enforces the state code, state building codes. The land plan, the land development code is not state building code, and the borough operates under the deferral from the state fire marshal. So okay. that's, they're they're tied back to the, to the state. And the fire marshal is the building official for the whole state of Alaska. And the municipalities, Anchorage, all those places have deferrals, so they can enforce their own code. But Anchorage actually was threatened when they were they were hanging back, adopting the 2012 IBC. They were still like on the 26 or something like that. State fire marshal actually threatened to pull their deferral from them mm -hmm. if they didn't get the code updated. And of course, the building department at Anchorage is a big money maker for the city, so that that uh, <coughs> gave a little bit of a little fire. Yeah. So then, with the fire marshal, it's not possible to have them say, "Okay, within these limits, uh, there's a box you have to check off that you've talked to city of Wasilla and uh, the well, even in Anchorage." Planning is separate from life safety, two different departments. Yeah. And so the planning people don't, they don't have really, really anything to do with fire codes or structural or mechanical or electrical. Well, they have some of two separate. Two yeah. separate but you don't get your permit in Anchorage till all of the agencies <coughs> sign yeah. off, whereas we if, don't if, have those intergovernmental if, agreements. If Wasilla had a deferral for land life safety, right. then you could probably tie everything right. together, but, but you don't. You can't right. stand <laughs> Maybe. And then that the municipality of Anchorage is enormous. Yeah, we'll it. yeah. Okay. Now Palmer has a Palmer funding. That's yeah, they, a deferral. There, the fire marshal is not. It used to be you had to submit for Palmer, and they charge for a whole full price for a permit. You had to submit to the state fire marshal, they charge a full price for a permit. Too. But now Palmer has their own deferral, but their fees are so horrendous now that it's not any different. As far as the cost for a permit, but they do have their own deferrals. They could they could enforce the zoning, the landscape, the land use codes as part of all part under underneath building safety and stuff. So then the a, a discussion is obviously there's maintenance, but then there's the tools of so there's two points. So when we're inspecting, normally we do a punch list and a, an acceptance inspection, and the acceptance inspection we say to the client, all of your landscape has been installed for our plans, you should pay the contractor. But withhold the amount for the warranty period. And then at the end of the warranty period, you come back and say, all of your plants have lived, they've established for a year, you should be okay, please water them. And normally at the acceptance, that's when there's a certificate of occupancy or a conditional one 
So the tool for holding that over someone's head doesn't exist because we're helpless, especially because contractors yell more than we do. Mm -hmm. um, and client, and they have more to hold over their clients, um, is having a tool to ensure that things are installed. But couldn't we write something in the code that says, well, maybe a business license doesn't get issued until you have the sign off. I mean, Which, although people open without a business license anyway, but at least they could be fined for operating well, without a business license. But if I'm a building owner and I lease it out, are you going to hold the tenant hostage? No, we hold the building owner. Right. And the building owner might just go, eh, come get me. So if you're a building owner, do you need a business license to rent? Yeah. Once yeah. You, for leasing? Mm -hmm. Once you're owner occupant. Okay. Yeah. And if you're an occupant, you have to have a tenant. Well, you still have to have a business license. I mean, oh, you still, so. yeah, it's just not a landlord. Yeah, business it's not that one. Right. Okay. <laughs> we have plenty yeah. of business licenses. Don't worry. <laughs> so that's a, 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 a bureaucratic possibility. Right. So we're, we're talking about enforcement how about the engineering part of it what what does what's the framework that's going to make things go well and how do you incentivize that because if if you don't submit a here's my plan to water all this crap because if your nearest hose bin like mine right now is 130 something feet away from the farthest corner I was going to drive that much hose. I think at a minimum, it's submitting a maintenance plan. Okay. And even yeah. better yet, submitting that you will have a contractor maintenance period, a maintainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people might just want to do it on their own. So that's another thing as to how they how it gets certified or whatever. Well, that's where you get the either or either you do a you do a maintenance bond or you do a contract. Yeah. Okay. You know for. Yeah, yeah. So that person, the contractors are responsible for the plant. That's all. Okay. So it's just right, really. Because what I would love as my person preparing these plans is that the client takes it seriously that they bring us out to check the quality of their contractor, that they get their value. It's a silly mm -hmm. argument to say you should call me up for a little bit of money to save you a whole bunch because right. X and Y, but it's, again, it's the one time developer. Um, but what I like about Fairbanks, Fairbanks, and you included, they have a landscape manual. And there are other, uh, Portland does it as well, that they have these guides that make it easier for people to look at it to understand how important different aspects are. And maybe that's, you know, I think what might be critical for City of Wasill is educating people on. How to water your grass. How to well, change oil in your car. You know, <laughs> rather than them needing you to get into the if you code, code is just have a document that says, here's what we're trying to achieve. You're our partner in this. Lots of pictures, <laughs> not much text. Oh, lots no. of pictures. <laughs> Drawings, big crayons. Mm -hmm. This, not this. Right. Okay. Um, I was going to say, I hope you like me again. It's usually not that loud. Usually I can't hear it. Sorry. So, throwing lots of ideas. Um, and I'm writing them all down, so I'll send Great. you guys an outline. I mean, it may not, okay. if you see anything weird, that's not what I meant to say or whatever, just look it over, but I'll send them out as just notes for you. So, I was interested if we could revisit, um, we had talked about kind of our goals about kind of looking around and seeing what works. Like, could we look at some one or two places that works and see what they've done um, to make that work and you know, see if we can use okay. some of that. Got any ideas? What's your favorites? Yours is beautiful. Okay. Thank yes. You. <laughs> um, the There's some applause with my <laughs> Native Hospital on the corner of Kinnick and one. Palmer Wasilla okay. is, is beautiful in a couple different ways. It has some public walking areas. And it has a little pond and it has and it's all kept all kept up nicely and um the bicycle shop next to wonderland park um is making an effort they 
put in some nice landscaping that was sturdy. That's what I like about mm -hmm. theirs. It's sturdy and it um, and it's being upkept enough. Okay. And it's been there a while. Because you you kind of covered a, spe a spectrum of them. Because the name hospital, they're huge. Yes. They have a big budget. They're, oh, I'm assuming they have a big budget. Yes. Um, and then all the way down to the landscape shop. Not landscape shop. Alaska Bicycle Bicycle shop. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, and that's where you have that weird little fencing. Yeah. And I did the art on that building, and he said, I have to plant two trees. <laughs> so my mosaic is behind these two trees two trees that are growing over it. You know what I mean? So there's negative you know, parts of it, too, but he needed parking, and he had a door there, and he needed a fence and so on. Um, so I get it, but I think the effort is good. I think what's interesting is so the, uh, the first code that I was familiar with was from 2006. So Target went in after that. Then. No, it's the same code. Oh, you yeah, mean. Yeah, so Target went in on. Oh, you're talking 2000, about the 96 code you were familiar with. Or whatever. It was 96 and they tweaked it in 2006. Okay. Then we rewrote it in 17. Yeah. And then tweaked it this year. And so Petco went in shortly after. Mm -hmm. so they Petco were the first was about ones. 2007, 2008. We did that. No, um, no. Is that on the Hacienda side? That pet, not the pet. The Petco. Petco. Petco was over by us. Petco Hacienda. was under the 17 code. Was it? No, it's that was like one of my first projects. Um, really? 2007, yeah. actually. That's one. Yeah, this one. So, and just for sites to go to is that that one. I think, and I don't know how, I haven't stopped by recently, but for mm -hmm. lands, so trees that have matured pretty well, uh, you know, fence or rocks or otherwise, just to see the longevity for the landscapes. And I so I think Target is good to have, you know, mm -hmm. see or, the benefits, because it's also good to point to people of like, oh, uh, Target was in version of our code number two. This is what it contributed. Petco was version 2.5 of the code. I was just at Petco and it is beautiful landscaping, but dry as hell. I mean, it's dying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're not no. either. They're, yeah, they're just letting it go. Everybody's yeah. mentioned points back to good maintenance. Mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. are maintained. And maintenance water. is easy with good install, too. That's right. Yeah. But, Gina, would you mind pulling up the Alaska Bicycle Center yeah. by yeah. Wonderland Park? Because oh. he's got. Yeah, I'll have to go to Google, but yeah. Home Depot looked pretty good too. They went. Yeah, they did a nice job. Putting more trees in and no shrubs. It's kind of interesting. And they've got a lot of um, irises, they got a lot of irises, and they are just cute. But again, I think it, yeah, it goes back to maintenance. They're all you know the irises look good because they're being maintained well. And then bark mulch looks good because it's being maintained or replaced or whatever. And it's the, the dirty thing. Oh, if you want a tree, oh, yeah. if you want a tree to get to oh, that's right, like. That's right. uh, Eight inch or ten inch caliper. Um, yeah, so provide so seven hundred cubic feet right. of soil. Should be right in here. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then I did notice what they did too is they put Sorry. rock Sorry. around the, the tree areas, areas. <laughs> bark is. around the viruses, yeah. Yeah. which I'm sure helps too. Yeah. Right. As far as the like, compaction of soil and everything. Yeah. Like yeah. Perennial beds, we typically put uh, mulch in anyways right. because otherwise, you know, the rocks we have to grow up through it. Yeah. That's look pretty good. Because small areas of bark mulch, especially for perennials, um, works. Yeah. But if someone contains it, I think it, uh, one 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 issue I know uh, with, with the landscape architects, and you guys can speak this as well. But uh, it seems that the linear, the way this code is, is very linear. Like you have to have a tree every thirty feet. You have mm -hmm. to have exponential. You know, and it ends up not allowing for a lot of creativity or grouping of plants. Right. And I think that was, uh, there, and there have been a little bit of changes with mm -hmm. the newest iteration yeah. where it says the maximum distance of X. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so tar start. <laughs> target target can be created now. Yeah. And yeah. I don't even yeah. know if pet code can be created now. Right. Um, pet suit. But it really pet suit. Pet suit. Pet suit is the one on the okay. well, west. Between, yeah. Pet something. Yeah. Um, well, pet co is the one you were talking about, okay. though, that was built in Fort. Pet suit is the other. Too many pets. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe not pets. <laughs> But, but there's that little bit of fence, and I mean, that's some nice greenery. There's not a lot of variety, but I mean, it's... They went with evergreens space. is what's yeah. nice about it. And they have their... 
their trees here. And these are the trees that you're talking about. You have these they chose, just so you know. <laughs> they oh, yeah. so no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. But yeah. they, they had to do it for the addition. Yes. So they were under the old code of six trees and 12 shrubs, and they didn't have any vegetation. So they were trying to, and they're all asphalt. Mm -hmm. There was no... So rather than, again, because even though the code didn't say it, the intent was never to take someone that's an existing business like this and make them dig up asphalt. Sure. So we tried to find the areas where yeah. they had some dirt left. Right. Go in and we put them in. Move the mosaic to the right of the door, probably, you know, just from or higher aesthetic. up or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, and yeah. what I yeah. like with um, some of the codes you provided, uh, you know, the evergreen trees that are there, that's not a good planting because those are going to look like trash. And, 10 years but it's good gonna, in there a bit but when they grow into each other like you never want to plant a spruce closer than 12 to 15 ideally 20 feet apart because, unless you're screening but then but the, the, they drop their branches lower down mm -hmm. um and then you lose your screening because you haven't maintained them as a screening tree and uh -huh. that's you know that's a challenge with where they planted them close to the building because now they look oh, like, yeah. now they look like lollipops yep um, right. so there's that right. aspect of code is and the, this code doesn't force close plantings, but it's something to be careful of with code decisions to make sure they don't force particular um, designs. Yeah, those things. In fact, I'm, I'm not an arborist at all, but I know growing up, we had some ornamental spruce trees. If you want them to go up, you drop them in the branches and they go. And they provide great access to roofs. Yes, they do. The Mugo pines are great in this area. What I found is they do, they're the sturdiest for snow plowing and for having the sand and the snow dropped on them um, in the wintertime. And they'll grow into trees if are you those let the them. Little ones yep, the little ones. And the critical thing, if you folks don't know, anybody that has them, they're fantastic if they're maintained. Each year they'll have a little green growth. It's called a candle. Um, you clip it about one third of the way down and they get bushy. They don't get big. Yeah, you can either keep them in shrubs or you can let them turn into trees. Because in my other, house, they're trees. Otherwise, if you, and in an urban, they're good there, but in an urban situation, in Anchorage, they used to be at intersections in different places, but they wound up having people uh, ignore the, hanging out in them oh, oh, or uh, yeah. causing sightline issues. Um, yeah. And there is a there's a dwarf version of Mugo Pines, yep, which are nice, but they're so tiny, they don't contribute to a streetscape. Go ahead. So this is one... See. And if people do put in dense evergreens like that, one of the things is that in 10 years, they should cut out every second one. So yeah. once they start to grow into each other. Um, oh, the tree itself? Yeah. Oh. And that's the, uh, if we're working with clients, instant landscape, we can put in plants densely for them. But then you also say to them, five or eight years later, transplant them out or cut them down. It's interesting. They must have runs of. And what's good is they have they have pine, which are a little bit more open, and they work to, a little bit better when they're close together. And they do have mugo pine in between them. You're just not I'm not. These are mugo pines, I think, popping in here. That are some of these are mugo pines that are turning into trees. They're not actually. Well, they're the pines that you're talking about, but I think yeah. they were shrubs to start with. And then I was actually driving down here. So you're talking about places that this is industrial here. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole bunch of nothing versus here's the other side of the street that has a fence, and that's a fence company. So sure, for them to put a decorative fence or a nicer fence is not a big deal. A regular business owner might, you know, cry about it, but they have the grass with the shrubs and the trees. And then you've got this one, and these were done under the old code, but the old code had so much that was just left up to interpretation. So same here with the shrubs and the trees. Um, in the building next door. Um, and more information, those are Canada Red, which the state is determined being invasive now. Uh, really? Why, what makes them invasive? Uh, they just spread pretty quickly into uh, um, river corridors and so on. Okay, good to know. But they provide great color. And they last long Crimson time. King Maple is a good one too. And they get nice and they have this, this nice canopy tree. Didn't notice all the trees out in front of Walgreens are all red. I don't know what kind they are, but they're all red. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it's the same ones. I think it's and, and it's the same with uh, their uh, relative of the Mayday trees. Uh, we haven't yeah. been about yeah. 20 years now since they've been considered invasive, and they're yeah. still all over the place because oh, yeah. they're nice trees. Yeah. So when you're looking at the industrial code section, drive down Mystery, 
because it's going to give you the eh side and the not so inside. I mean, the nicer side, but this, you know, so some of these are reasonable. And then one thing our code doesn't require is any screening, which if you're on an interior road, probably doesn't matter. When you're on Mystery or Lucas, it kind of, people just failed on their photos this year. I don't know what. what? Is there, there's another one down here that did the same thing, just went in with grass and some trees and some rocks. And, and they maintain their lawn, looks, looks nice. Yeah, looks you know, nice an industrial nice. site. When Anchorage went to a new code, something they did, which made things really much easier, where they had, and you don't necessarily have the same levels of zoning, but they just had this great table that talked about, that would compare, you know, industrial next to industrial. You don't have to do anything industrial next to a oh, for uh, the screen uh, collector the road. Yeah, to do this. So this is a really nice way for someone to see that if they have a commercial site next to residential, they need to put in a screening landscaping. Um, so having a table like this, I think, really simplify things. We just built a check in. Certainly has a lot better aesthetic. I mean, and good on the right, okay on the left, and garbage for the down. And you don't necessarily have so many use specific standards. Right. Um, it's kind of covered within the buffer areas for those types. Um, but that might be uh, like for salvage yards, storage yards, uh, those kind of things. If, if as a community you look at these areas to see what's not working well, mm -hmm. is to identify and use specific items that need to be treated a certain way. I think borough code says if you have a junkyard, you have to have a fence. Yeah, and it might. I don't know why ours never yeah. did. And when I yeah. went through, I just didn't catch it. And. Are you subject to borough code at all? No. Okay. No. So this was another thing. So I've got other things from other communities I won't give you guys, but I figured I would just give you the Alaska stuff this time. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I saw that was interesting, I think this is Texas. No, yeah, George, um, Texas. So what they did was kind of what you're, it ties with that chart scenario, meaning they identify their major corridors that are their visual corridors. Mm -hmm. And then everything outside that has lower standards. So it may be something that you guys want to consider too for Wasilla. I don't know, it may end up that you get too many roads anyway, but you may want to do it in some kind of, you were talking about we didn't have as many categories, but you could categorize your roads and have standards based on the road corridor type versus, you know, more visible, higher standards, less visible, yes. The, one of the simplicities with Angry, they have L1, 2, 3, and 4 landscaping. Yeah. L1 right. is visual enhancement, which is parking perimeter um, and site perimeter, exactly like what you have. And then L2 is screening, which is used like between a, a school and residential, or that it starts to escalate. And so you have the parts that apply to those, and then L3 is a buffer landscape, which is higher, and then L4 is freeway. Right. And the parallel for that is that for Anchorage, you have to have that, I talked about Target. Anchorage, when you get in, when you come into city, it ends at like Mul not Muldoon, uh, ends at like Airport Heights. And then when you go south, it starts at a certain area that there's this requirement for a type of landscape along the roads to maintain Alaska character. Believe it or not, for Anchorage, you maintain Alaska character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about us? But so that's why, you know, when you're driving uh, up from Girdwood or uh, in from this direction, it's uh, the city still has the spruce and kind of the native vegetation mm -hmm. until a certain point. Buffering. Well, so for you, with the, any roads, if you do want a higher level of visual impact to it, that might be a great way to put a focus on things. Mm -hmm. Because I think that one of the disappointing things with BOT or otherwise is. Um, your code has taken the burden of street trees onto property owners versus Anchorage uh, municipality or DOT in Anchorage are forced to do landscape within the right of ways to achieve um, street trees. Really? Even in the suburban areas? Yeah, so any, Out, any, street, your any street project, that kind of thing is supposed to involve, uh, wow. um, it's supposed to because <laughs> the design manual. I was going to say, because when they redid Lucas and Lucille, it was pulling eye teeth to get them to scoot the 
pathway away from the edge of the curb. They wanted it right on the edge of the curb. It's like, could you at least put a two or three foot strip of grass? If you, they mm -hmm. wouldn't give us a tree. They said there will be no trees. You cannot have trees. You will do everything you can, you yeah. can to avoid it unless so. there is some local uh, a plan requirement for yeah. plan. Yeah. Yeah, which is what we ran into for downtown, but it's another thing. So. And that might be, you know, also on the list of the wishes for things of, you know, what to put in to force other people to be good partners. And there's one other thing to think about. And the only reason I'm throwing it out there, I know you guys are coming up on 615, but you don't have to talk about it tonight. And I'm going to keep pushing it in front of you. I've asked the MEA to get me something in writing. So one thing that they called me out to a site. Actually, it's this one here. So you think it's this one, right? Because the power lines are here. Yeah. They're like unhappy about these trees. They're actually far enough away. The one that they're unhappy about is this little guy here that I can't even tell where the shrubs and the tree. This is a tree right here. Right. <laughs> and buried into this little mess, there's little trees right here. Oh, yeah. I'll come get it. And then there's little shrubs. Yes. Yeah, so they had me meet them on site. And they said their trees are within X feet of whatever. Our code clearly says, do not put trees under the power lines and do not put any within 15 feet if they grow of a certain height. So I pulled this site and I don't know who did the landscape plan, but it was a landscape architect firm. Actually, I think they were from somewhere North Alaska. They put the trees under the utility. There's a little tiny note over here that says, oh, there's a utility easement. You got the minimum trees checked, boxes checked. I didn't require them. That's what they submitted on the plan. So thoughts on how to, you've mentioned that you put on your plans now that it's very important that you install it the right way. If you put trees in the utility, I may not catch that they're there. And if you bill your client for those trees and MEA cuts them down, we're not responsible for that. Because for all I know, you're willing to take the risk that they're not gonna cut your tree down and you're putting extra in above and because the code says do not do it. Yeah. And that is, it's a funny thing with projects is that, you know, don't plant trees underneath building canopies, but sometimes they get shown on plans because people don't look at the second floor or uh, <laughs> with utility easements. And we want people to have brain. So if something gets missed, one of the things is that, uh, within our contractor notes, the contractor is responsible to assess site conditions to ensure that they're compatible with the design. Um, Things get missed. I think where the that kind of comes in is that I don't, the problem is that they don't know what to do because, like for this one in particular, what they have to landscape is that you know easement. Yeah. And so they're like, well, if this is the area I have to landscape, what do I do rather than putting in a tree? Now, well, no, it landscape. just says you don't have to put. Trees. Oh, you don't have. Yeah, yeah you don't have to put a tree. Okay. That's so, why I was like surprised when I pulled the plan. There was a tree and shown, and I'm think, like, well, why would you do that? There are different, and it, you know, it's probably a conversation as well. There are different species that you can put in that either can be pruned effectively, yes, but or things like uh, an ammer, uh, but not under ammer maple. They they won't allow anything under. Period. But and, and that's maybe some education for them, but there are species that don't get that help. Well, they know we that. Don't they don't want to have to deal with it. Here's the thing, okay. though. You, you, you can look at a tree and tell them species. Yeah, I can. Um, I can I can name a few. The line clearing people, if it's got a trunk on it this big, it's hydrized. It's gone. Okay. It's, they, they care not. I think the issue with the code in regard to the utilities is that it doesn't say that you're not you're not required to install that tree like you have to have a tree every 30 feet people are thinking i still got a tree there every 30 feet it just shouldn't be put in that easement i yeah. guess and so i think we should need to clarify that or in this guy's case putting in an easement yeah. in you're, bush. you aren't required to put that tree in and you were and i love checklists so if there was a two or three page uh, manual that at the beginning of it just has here are the main things that get you out of landscape requirements. It actually is near the front. I thought it was in the back because yeah. I told the guy it was in the back, but it's not in the back, it's up near the front, which is why it's like it's interesting. But if you had a bush there that MEA wouldn't care. They said they turn a blind eye, but they don't even like that they because they said it, well, they say NSTAR may have to dig up underground and they'll take your bushes out and it's on you if you're you're in there. I'm like, so you're telling me 
we can't have anything but grass anywhere in the city if there's a power line within 100 feet of it, basically. And they'll cut that into <laughs> They'll leave it up and not put it back. And I think that goes back to the different entities. So uh, again, a parallel for Anchorage is that uh, you still have to put the shrubs. So if you have a power line overhead, you're allowed to substitute a six foot tall shrub at the time of planting um, for a tree. Um, so lilacs are perfect because you can actually get them in that size and then you have your normal shrubs, but it's always on the owner if they plant with an easement. If it's an underground easement, you can plant it. But if NSTAR comes through and they dig it up, you're responsible to replace what they took up. But the, it's, but the municipality doesn't say, well, you don't have to plant there. They say you have to plant there and you're taking right. on that responsibility. Yeah, and that's what this says. It says only plants that won't create persistent utility maintenance or interference problems can be installed where overhead. They not trees may not be directly below the power lines, and trees and vegetation within an easement may not achieve heights greater than 10 feet or intrude from the side closer than 15 feet to power lines. And they said we're perfectly fine with all that, and with the large mature crowns being 30 feet away, they said the code is fine. But the plans that these people are pulling out show them in there anyway. And so it's like, how do we make it clear to the owner that don't let your the person drawing your landscape plan, whether it's your cousin or uh, an architect, you know, from Fairbanks or someone that doesn't Sometimes read the code. People but. miss things. Well, yeah. and the, the good thing is it's a fairly simple code. Mm -hmm. And you do have a requirement for what gets submitted. So I think you just add another requirement that on your cover sheet, you have uh, these notes on it that state, you know, no planting with, you know, that it just winds up becoming the idiot's guide to what the cover sheet looks like. Yeah, and I think as far as code goes, we just need to add that language in that says what you do in the case. Because I don't think it's your intent that you don't landscape or you don't in, uh, improve an easement area, right? Because then if you, if you were to not put your landscaping in that easement, you put it outside, now you're eating into the usable area mm -hmm. of the lot. Yeah. And I don't know that that's what you guys really want mm, no. to happen, right? No. So we just need to clarify. This, this, right? <laughs> right. this was an oops. Right. Right. This is a, you know, I think it's not right. our only oops, though. That's yeah, what I'm no. afraid of. I think when I pull these others, I'm going to find that, that whoever drew their plans up. And again, some of these were under the days of no landscape architect was required. <laughs> How about the trees next to the well, I know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. Library, large that was DOD, I think, or I don't know who did that. Or the city did it. I'm not sure who did it. Not Before my library, time, I would have never done that. Cruising. No, no, no. no, on cruising. Between okay. cruising and the library. And they cut them all down. Because they, they were just the yeah. mm -hmm. No, yeah. a few years back, they cut yeah, them down. They cut down the one here on the corner of City Hall because it was the little wire coming off the pole to the city. I'm like, why do you care? <laughs> we lose our power line. We got to pay to put it back. Just we're willing oh, no. to take the risk. I think it's just hard to hammer everybody. Yeah, they did. It's because of the. It's because we denied that it. That is there. standard for all power companies. I think it happened up here no. recently. Oh my gosh! It was some area shot down. Yeah, a lot of fires. They yeah. just kind of hollowed out through this tree yeah. around it. You're just working to. It's oh, pretty funny you're driving cold. along. It's not like there's a one-sided tree. Yeah. They say they're doing away with that, and the, they said that they're he said they're actually ahead, which they probably are, because like Tim just said with the fires, right. they're now get, other utilities are getting strict. They're not letting them anywhere close because they don't want to have to create those donut holes around a tree One or whatever. The, the precedence is there from California, I believe, yeah. where wildfires were started mm -hmm. by the lines there, and they blamed that the electric company is liable for the. And so their answer well, there's a little this. bit more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, right. That's where you still live. You so look at it, though. You weren't breaking the forest. outside looking in as a utility company. <laughs> hey, these guys have liability for this. So now, you know, if that's going to be forced on us, right. knock them all down. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. yeah. All the right way to the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Break it. Now they do, like I said, they said they're fine with shrubs. They're not going to cut the shrubs down. They don't care about even the boulders or the decorative pieces. As long as they've got a certain distance that they, they there's something around the pole itself. They want a clear area yeah. around the pole, and they say they're not getting those either. Um, you can be able to climb them and not get hurt. Yeah. I figure most of them are from a bucket anymore nowadays. So. <laughs> Occasionally they do climb them. Yeah. 
So it seems from the discussion with all the folks on maintenance is that does address some of the things I think we've talked about breathing from plant size point of view, because one of the benefits for the larger plant sizes is to try to get a little more instant landscape. Whereas with proper means somehow uh, having a better guarantee to it, the smaller material tends to establish faster and then get bigger faster. Um, because right now, even if it's just larger material, it's, it's larger material that's dead in you know, six months or 12 months. And on the same side, yeah, it's a maintenance requirement. I mean, they're already, developers are already wanting about how expensive they can put landscaping in. Yeah, maintenance to it, increase the cost. So now we have to. You know, I mean, it well, I think costs. that uh, for that, you know, that 30 foot section is $1,200 with the perennials in theory for that 30 foot section costing a significant amount. So there, I think there's yeah, different really aspects of this yeah. that can trade yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, in, and in fairness to the intent of the code, it's just a matter of the end of it looking and going, still achieving the same intent, right. but being more yeah. maintenance focused. Right. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, you can plant fewer targets. It's a very emotional topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're dying plants. Yeah. I mean, you could get a lot more out of a true landscaping if you put it in right to begin with. And <laughs> but I die. All right. Um, I feel like I want to give you a hug or something. <laughs> I've never seen someone get so emotional. Right. Oh, right. That, that, that wasn't anger. Right. Code. Um, um. <laughs> wow, that's not funny. Um, yeah. I mean, new landscaping always kind of looks fun. Mm -hmm. Just these little things. Three years later, it looks great. Just gotta get there. So one of the benefits, whether it's with DOT or with Anchorage, is having standard specifications. Um, and I, the city of Basila doesn't have standard specifications, right? There's, uh, it's, uh, it, quote, it says something. It says like, well, they, they, look use, at, they use, they use the mass, yeah. mass, mass yeah. system. Yeah. Okay. It, and, that, and that's one of the things that I think even just uh, within the code as well, speaking to topsoil, is you know, topsoil will meet mass standard or having a standard for it. Um, it, it, it the challenge for us is always what do we point to to make the contractors better or the clients better? And if something is written in code or otherwise, we can use that. So it's really that each of us plays a part right, to put the fear of something into someone. So does Anchorage have mass for a mass standard spec for landscaping? And stuff? Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's actually a, it's a very good section yeah. from a, a, a quality point of view. Mm -hmm. It was updated about 15 years ago to quite good. I don't even know. I don't know where it's called out. Yeah, mass is what I mean when I design a site. That's what I call it. Out. Okay, mass. for all yeah, of your school. The city, city wants to. Yeah, the public works department. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. All their stuff. Yeah. Because we wound up going to sheet specs for these projects yeah. just to make sure they're in people's hands. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when you have, have sheets issue. of drawings, yeah, exactly. You said, I'm calling out mass. I say, you know, use mass right at the top, beginning of it, and then they're. Like, oh, what, that, you know, how's this supposed to be installed? I'm like, we did do by mass. mass, we did by volume. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then the city of Palmer went a step further, at least, and just replaced all the municipality of Anchorage logos to oh. see a Palmer logo, nice. basically. <laughs> so they just plagiarized the entire thing, you know, that's how it's done. But, uh, yeah, exactly. Makes sense. And when you Google city of Palmer specs, Something comes up. Mm -hmm. And that so, is a benefit. If they're known, is the reference specs. And I know one of the documents you provided to him as well was a uh, you know, reference of looking at the uh, tree size, the height, that kind of thing. What we always reference is uh, where that came from would be this. So that's the UV ANSI, where we don't, uh, any code typically doesn't talk about quality. All you do is you set it based on two inch caliber, and then that book provides everything else. But it's familiarity. And do we want to talk about goals for next time? Or? Well, I think personally, it's time to take the ideas and then make them concrete. Yeah. So the, the ideas, we've swirled them around see if we can put something into written form 
that reflects the the engineering of it, so to speak. You know what what looks good, what's going to lead to looking good versus. I really like what Tina provided for this sheet of kind of the quantitative aspects of it. Um, so for committee process. Mm -hmm. um, our final product is going to be making recommendations mm -hmm. yep, to the commission, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it can be either broader recommendations or you can get in the weeds and draft language. Probably both, maybe. Yeah, or it can be some of both. So, uh, the, whether it's the mulch, the plant sizing, you know, the quantitative things of the code that um, we can go through and discuss, maybe that's where we start next week and then those do need to be taken in context that if we're making things easier they have to be followed by the conversation of i think it's an absolute imperative that we share with them the why of a lot of these things if you don't start off by saying hey we think this because they're going to sit there and rewrite it all and muck it all up and, yeah. but if you start off saying it, we believe if you start with light with maintenance in mind you're going to get a better product three years from now. If you just get down to the nitty, you know, I counted plants and threw them on the ground and checked it off, you're going to get what you got. I think visuals are going to be good, and unfortunately, I'm going to look at that end of the table because you've got the two landscape architects at that end. So when you're talking about, that's why I say you, you can either get in the weeds as far as how to write the code, or you can give a visual example of when you do these quantitatives, what would this look like, even if it's just a rough drawing by hand? You and know, from that of, strategy perspective, not being familiar with the composition of the commission, um, is there a best approach to get it in front of them where they'd be like, this looks awesome, check? I think the visual is going to, it's, you know, like several have already said, it's that show them what up. this will, the end result will be, and then outline how this will be easier, how it will be more efficient, more cost effective, you know, all of these kind of the benefits. And then, you know, if we can get an example that's an actual on the street example that's similar, that'd be great. If we can't, that's neither here nor there, but at least having that drawing in front of them to see, because that's where they run into is they don't know how to visualize what that actually looks like. They, you know, they struggle with the current code as to what does that actually look like on the ground. And so in, in, in our, our business, when we do building space programming, we create vignettes, rooms with how they could possibly be laid out, how they could possibly be used. So I'm thinking same thing when we're talking about landscaping and different concepts, create a series of little vignettes mm -hmm that are that are uh, shows examples of what and I, I kind of like you know we, we talked about every a tree every 30 feet or something well so you got 600 feet of frontage clump those trees so that on the average is 30 feet rather than just <coughs> pop them in there 30 feet that so uh, this goes back procedurally for me is so sometimes working with commissions as a committee they invest a lot of faith in the committee and they're like, if something comes in front of them, they look through it, but they don't get into the weeds with it. What kind of flavor of commission is it that if we came to them with something pretty well thought out, explained it to them, showed them some photos, like how detailed nope. are they going to get into They're the ones who, I mean, they got the letter from the Landscape Architect Society, but they have always said they wanted someone to attend the meetings that actually does this, that has input, that could give them some suggestions, because they say they're not subject matter experts. Okay. Now, I'm not a subject matter expert in drawing them drawing a plan and how easy it is to maintain that plan, how easy it is to necessarily explain the installation on the ground, that part of it. My expertise lies in what's the economic value of landscaping? How does this you know, improve the quality of life? Mine's the soft skill versus the specialized skill. So they're looking for that technical skill. So I think they're gonna put a lot of weight by it. Um, city council is a little bit harder to call. Okay. Um, they all have a lot of questions, so probably whoever's the most comfortable or if there's multiple people that want to attend, you know, whenever it gets in front of the city council, that would probably be helpful because they may ask questions that are beyond my scope. You know, I can repeat what I heard, but if it goes to the next level, then it may be like, and you will, I don't know, <laughs> and I you know, like, kind of thing. Yeah, so For killing two birds with one stone as well as any exhibits that we develop could also. Oh, yeah, they would go up, forward. Yeah. Well, but they could wind up being in this manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because it's the visual. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <coughs> somebody's already done it. Pleasure as hell. Well, if you look at the downtown overlay district, they have several pictures, and graphics, all that kind of stuff about what the intent of, yeah. of that is. And going back to that example is, you know, it's two exhibits. One is saying, yeah, you can, you know, put trees 30 feet on center and do it like this, and it'll be nice. So, or you can group them up. You know, mm-hmm. this is kind of the range of things you can do. And so the right. does. Mm-hmm. I think what you may get, if I don't think the, the perennial flowers are, to be honest, even as the planner, I wish they had never been in and we lowered them from 16 to nine anyway, and I still don't like it. I mean, it just isn't working. I don't know why it's so hard. You can see all these houses that do these nice mix of perennials and all this, but when it comes to these commercial sites, they're just like, oh, iris. That's the only choice we have is an iris. We're putting in an iris and we're putting them in a linear yeah. fashion. I'm like, you can find them. They're cheap and they, but I don't know why they can't be grouped. So like if you go in 10 foot yeah, squares and all that group. and do them in groupings, but they seem to run in this linear spread. I'm like, I'm linear, but I'm not artistic. So how come? I can't... Okay, and that's what I'm thinking. So. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, flowering shrubs instead of perennials anyway, except for at entrances for, you know, wow factor. Getting into that incentive. Yeah. The, the community good aspect. Yeah. So I think there's other ways to accomplish this without it being those. I'm like, is there any? Is there any? Um, Years ago in Anchorage, they used to have what they call bonus points in their zoning code. In right. the downtown business. Downtown uh, area where they still but they, were, they really work well. In, in my opinion, they weren't really bonus points. You will put these in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like along the street, I remember years ago doing, it was Lamex, now it's the LED building and all that kind of stuff. And you got these little dead trees sitting out. In front of I put those in there. But that was They weren't dead point. when you put them in. Yeah. That was a bonus point because, and then you put in some punched uh, pattern sidewalk out in front, so you could do some other stuff with the building itself and stuff. And mm-hmm. so that's what I'm thinking is, mm-hmm. if there are trade-offs where, yeah. you know, like we talked about, maintenance, irrigation versus soil prep or something like that. You know, there's, and uh, I'm helping with the downtown uh, volunteering with the downtown code rewrite. Mm-hmm. And one of the interesting things is we're removing all of those requirements in order to facilitate development. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things for Anchorage was they had all these bonus points to allow you to go yep. taller with your building. Yep. But now we're saying we want businesses downtown for tax base. Mm-hmm. And I know that's something with the city as well is that they're to encourage development, but not at the expense of the community. Right. So we're putting a lot of focus now on trying to figure out how you define the trade-offs for buildings mm-hmm. to create a better streetscape or better community mm-hmm. environment, even on yeah. property. Yeah. But the biggest negative there is that we would love it downtown is that these developers doing it on a specific site doesn't make sense sometimes to be able to put money into a pool of money that then would get spent mm-hmm. within mm-hmm. the public realm. A payment in lieu of uh, kind of like wetland mitigation. Or, well, Helena used to have, Helena Montana has a uh, down, what do you call it? The, EID business improvement district yep. and that's what they do is people kick the businesses basically kick into a big pool and then the city has a spending power yeah. that pool to do more. sidewalks walking malls all sorts of stuff mm-hmm. and then they keep track but I think between the boulders and the fencing or maybe um you know heaven forbid like artwork or something mm-hmm. that if there's something within the code that encourages somehow that you you need to do something from this list of four things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where it's going part for the code is facade improvements or your site, you have to choose two out of this list of six things. One of them is like landscaping, one is a facade, you know, cool facade, that kind of way you approach it. Yeah. 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 Well, that's lots of ideas. So do you guys need anything from my staff? Or you guys coming up with these ideas and you'll get them to me. I'm willing so, to help, but I homework. I don't feel like I have a homework list yet. So other than get you the notes, and I'll try and get those out this week to you. Sure, the better on that. Yeah. Uh, and then you have that little just outline, yeah. so you've got the table and you can start filling Let's in start your on. suggestions. And if you have examples of codes or whatever, I'll be glad to you know, it, try and create. 
It sounds like there's three chunks of time. One is to look at quantification of the code. The second is to look at maintenance, because that's yep. been the core of our discussion. The third would be to look at what we might call incentives. Yep. Okay. Because between the three of those, that kind of creates it. So if you, here, it just thought to cross my mind. So let's say they put in, they upgrade their soils and they upgrade their, they put in an irrigation system. Do you let them get away with smaller plants or do you, I mean, is there some trade off there? Well, and maybe there's an option. So <coughs> some sites, if they're smaller, maybe they reduce parking spaces or something, mm -hmm. you know, that can right. help work with a lot of these sites because mm -hmm. especially across the railroad tracks, those mm -hmm. lots are very narrow mm -hmm. and very yeah. small. Because so they mm -hmm. don't really fit. You can't really put a building there and accommodate the modern code. So if right. you can, the strange thing I wouldn't tie to smaller plants because if you, if the crappy owner is probably better off putting in small plants because they might survive better. <laughs> um, so trying to find those trade offs to buy the incentives. Right. I would mean, think maybe fewer, fewer plantings or something like that. So, yeah. so you're at least offsetting some of the cost to yeah. do, right. do a better. Yeah. Um, so what, what, you have, is what you have, even if it's not the quantity that you want, the quality is going to be there eventually when it matures and stuff. And right. that's, this will be the, it's easy to look at plant size on the individual pieces, but how they come together, mm -hmm. and especially with trying to encourage incentives, it's, it'll be a fascinating discussion. Because I watched some of my <laughs> trumps just went nuts and some of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You want to write that one out? Yeah. Um, so they, and I've seen code where they talk about the kid cover sizes. So, I mean, it gets to kind of be complicated for a plan, but you can get a plan that'll cover three or four square feet versus having three or four perennials. You have one shrub there. Gigantic things. And it's a cost saving for the client, and it, you have a lot more options up here because I know we have a hard time finding a lot of perennials. Especially in the quantities we need, so and it and it allows designers to have a little bit more creativity and then you get into the beautification of things and so. If the grand intent is to make it look good, how right. do you write code that says what look what looks good <laughs> and what looks good over time? That might be the fourth thing is a, a, the opinion. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know that's a challenge, and I think uh, I think planting soil we should somehow make it uh, compulsory. Because planting soil would validate smaller plant sizes. And then when it comes to the incentives or other things, we'd be figuring out the irrigation system, the maintenance, maybe some site benefits. Uh, I think there needs to be some flexibility. Because flexibility will allow people to think. Well, and if somebody thinks A is beautiful and B isn't, then having a little bit of flexibility to do B versus A. You just have to prescribe your flexibility. The only reason I say that is. They don't typically oh. give flexibility to the, the planner, yeah. and that's not a bad thing because it should go to, to to an appointed commission or board because the favoritism question always comes up. Oh, well, you like me, so you let me do nothing, but that person, oh, mm -hmm. you're just because you don't like me because I said something mean to you last week. That's mm -hmm. why you're sticking it to me, so you can't. Right, you can well, you write it. Yeah, that's what code. I'm saying. It has to be prescribed flexibility. Mm -hmm. So you have the... One one good thing in Anchorage Code is they the equity uh, thing. included alternative equivalent compliance, which is a non-variance. Yeah, I saw that, and it's working really well so far mm -hmm. because you have to uh, illustrate that what you're doing still provides a, a, a stormwater benefits, a air quality benefits. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the main way it's been used is this area is too small to put in some planting, so the planting happens elsewhere on the site. Mm -hmm. Or they use a different screening method. Um, right. So that might be mm -hmm. sure. for flexibility. But it does bring in opinion, which is always dangerous. And I saw one overall cross from mystery. I don't know what it is when it crosses the street, but they had actually put a stone wall in that was about three foot high. So it doesn't create that, you know, uh, the break in, you know, the hazard for break ins, you know, for blocking mm -hmm. the visibility. But instead of doing shrubs and some plantings if you did a nice decorative wall around your parking lot instead. I mean, there's a cost initially, but there's no maintenance cost or hardly any after you do it. 
during the Anchorage Code rewrite from 10, 15 years ago, they were looking at the bonus point, a unit system. So there were things like that, but it just wound up getting to be really um, yeah. uh, elaborate. And nobody had done the economic analysis for it. So I went through and I figured out that, oh, if you plant uh, spruce trees, you'll get the cheapest landscape and you'll check off all the boxes. So the problem with those uh, credit, the, the point systems, you can work the system depending on the cost for any given year. And that's the, the challenge. You just figure out, oh, this is cheaper this year. I'm just going to put a billion poke villa. <laughs> <laughs> I have a surplus of these. Just tell me to pick them right there. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's something you want to disincentivize. Well, anyway, my brain's full. How about anybody else? Public, oh, yeah. do we, do we, do we, uh, so this committee of the whole, I'm not necessarily fully familiar with that. How do we, uh, what do we do next? Well, we exit the committee hall and during the meeting. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Or just somebody else move to adjourn. Well, yeah, we actually, we technically have to. Oh, that's true. Actually, yeah, then well, we would ask. Nobody signed in, so nobody asked in, so. Maybe it's because my brain's full, but do we figure out what, what, are, we, what are we, what are we trying to do for, next, for the next meeting? So we're going to go through this. Quantity so standards. Yeah, quantity we, standards. We, we got to break this down on a little framework. Yeah. I mean, it's some kind of Um I think we have to begin with him in mind that this is going to go to two other groups. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to tell the story of mm -hmm. why, why we spent X many Monday afternoons mm -hmm. to stare at each other. And that we're, the intent is to <clears throat> One, I know they're going to want to know how, how do you make it easier for business. Mm -hmm. Two, how do you make it pretty? Whatever that opinion is, but dead plants are not pretty. I think we all can agree on that. Mm -hmm. uh, being maintainable is, I think, helps reinforce that. Um, so telling that story and then making it understandable for the average person. So I think if you start with that story and then from there we give recommendations on, okay, because if they understand that and then they can see pictures and then make some drawings and examples. Here's how we address this up or do that. And then at the end, you just here's your code recommendations, do what you want. Because I've sat on a couple of city council meetings. I promise you everybody reads everything every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But there's always questions whether they read or not. <laughs> oh, well, you can tell by their questions who did and who didn't. <laughs> um, but I think at that point, if you can put it down and that's me ask the question, and you go, well, if you look at things right here. At that, that point, uh, questions get a little thin or they get really good. So I think we can, that's where I see it going. If that's the, the end product for this group, and then we just build back and start off with the framework next time and start going. I think this is a decent start. And a couple more stories and some drawings. And I mean, any anybody having to add to that disagreements or whatever. I think I'm just interested in that. The the wisdom of working best with the commission and with the, you know other people are involved in this and how much needs to be documented versus having some people come and speak to the things yeah. behind it. I think, and that's a whole package too. So they, need, they want to see faces, and I'll be honest, they want us to do the work. They don't want to do it. They want to be able to say, look, everybody, because nice people brought us a product. <laughs> and, and somebody will have to meddle in it and tune it and you know, change a number here and there. That's always how it goes. Mm -hmm. Just once they've made it theirs, then they vote yes. Um, and then at that point, then he's dropped in the city council, and who knows? But at that point, our job's done. I mean, they're clearly receptive to it. The, the <laughs> they council wouldn't, it. They, council wouldn't have approved it if they didn't want to hear. And the commission wouldn't have taken the recommendation if they didn't want to hear. So it's not yeah. like, it, you know, it's being forced down their throats against their will or something like that. So they want to hear the input. And I think, yeah, you just got to build your story and why and how this is better and why it's better and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, they're looking for a solution. Um, you have to hit the the main groups because they're all going to get catch flack because someone's going to interpret it some way that's not positive always happens and you know you have to make it good for 
the people that live here, good for the businesses that go on here and the ones that come want to come here. Because there's a lot of them that run away because they just can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, it was a struggle for me, but somebody who was not as established who can do yeah, that. Tough. But don't forget, there's some that want to come here, but if it's not a high enough standard, they don't want any part of it, too. Also true. Yeah. So, so you have to, it's that choosing, you know, mm -hmm. it's that balance. Why, why do I want to show up if I'm so, you know, back next to these two numbers? Right. Suppliers? Right. And for, for applying this a fair amount as well, I feel like there's a fair amount of low hanging fruits in it. Mm -hmm. It would be easy yeah. to talk to and the quantitative aspects. And what I want to do is, you know, I keep on speaking of Anchorage because it works relatively well. Is that what I'm interested in with this group is even kind of briefing or uh, um, bringing up some things where the changes might happen. So beyond the low hanging fruit is, do you start to use language like visual enhancement or a different, you know, how, do, how does the perimeter and parking, how do these things start to come together? So uh, whether as a resource for making recommendations to you guys and supporting them, um, you know, that next step of code refinements to make it even easier to understand is what I'm interested in. Yeah. But I think even if we dealt with maintenance uh, incentives and quantitative stuff, that would be a super big win. Mm -hmm. And I think that generally people would be happy unless they just don't want to landscape. <laughs> and they keep going to Houston. <laughs> We're just a mile that way. Or yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's over. Go on, Quebec away, so you're cool. <laughs> well, I'm going to be downtown. Well, then act like it. Yeah. So, should we motion to start the public hearing or? I was in community hall, and I made a post exit in community hall. Going on, stress is old. No one's put down. Um, hearing no objections, moved on to public comment. I have no public comment. Um, any any uh, committee member comments for the record? All right, hearing none, uh, any opposition to adjourn? From one twice over adjourned at 6.52 of all. Thank you. This is a, this is a very nice conversation. Good. Well, I think one. I'm going to cry about it. You got to start. Yeah. Someone got, I know, right? <laughs> Someone got emotional. Nice, nice job. Yes. Yeah. It was there, that one. To be fair, I get emotional when people cut down spaces. <laughs> oh, that was brutal. And should we leave our uh, little name tag things here? Yeah, you can just leave them here. So, and I'll so no, don't fill any more trees. Pat said yeah. yes about that. Oh, perfect. Can we give you something from Pat? You want a present? Sure. Mm -hmm. I like presents. It's not a good present. It's no, house. they're not a present. <laughs> Take no, it away. One of those. Oh, is this Firehouse? Yeah. Uh, no, no, you're not going. No, 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 no. You, you, wait, firehouse. No, they were last year. All right, fine. The one that's already been permitted. No, I was going to say it's not online. Otherwise, I just have you uploaded online. What do you have? Uh, that's that's it, it, we that's got it in January. We went to online permitting. Okay. So any new projects you do, you won't have to wait ink anymore. They'll just choose your name out of the accounts, and then you just upload them. Oh, I didn't have a social chat. I don't know if I was considered or not. I was uh, going to go to apply for a driveway permit. Oh, no, I'm not in charge of driveway permits. Yeah, so that's your system, not public permits. It's it's thanks, yeah thanks it's a citywide system okay. but they're i don't think they're quite ready to go i know i was going to okay. say you guys take, take yeah, two I or three I, I know i started to say something but you guys were on a roll so on a roll huh okay is it yeah because he's like oh try to use the system and i was trying to find the driveway permit it's not on and there so see so if i go see, and i told them this i'm not throwing on the bus because i you know they just had the change with danielle you. yeah you're welcome and uh, so they, um, somebody was saying something about it, and I went. I was on the user end, you know, where you would go, and I'm like, "There's no choice for a driveway permit. Take two or three. There's two. Yeah. Otherwise, staff will just fill up." But um, they, um, so. Got work for Thank you.